Well, everybody, welcome back. We're gonna continue this series here, just talking a little bit of better or a little bit about pursuing a better investment experience. And today, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, that free lunch, or at least oh, that's what everybody what? talks about, right? Is free lunch, the free lunch and in investing, and that's diversification. Uh, and we've got a saying around here that we we love to practice smart diversification. And Justin, since you're the smartest guy I know, this is the perfect conversation. <laughs> uh, and so. You know, at the end of the day, I think people think about diversification and there's a lot of, I guess, mystery around it, misunderstanding. Hey, let's buy a few stocks. Let's just make sure one's in tech. Let's make sure, you know, one's in industrials. I mean, the talking head Jim Cramer, right? The, we were the just Jim, talking the, about the Jim Cramer model right yeah. there. Yeah. Just hit the button, buy, 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 sell, 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 as long as they're spread out. <laughs> uh, folks, that isn't smart diversification. Let's just start there. Uh, but, you know, as we start to, to unpack this, Justin, I'd love to turn it over to you. You know, as we start even at the basic building blocks of building a portfolio, and we're thinking about being diversified for our clients, you know, where do, where do you even start? It's a big question. Uh, sim simple topic, if you if you want to think about it in its most basic sense, right? You kind of alluded to it. Diversification is is really at the end of the day making sure you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. But when you look about look at the investing landscape, and again, throughout this series, I want to really underscore we're talking primarily public markets here, and, and it's really important to to underscore that. The starting point is, is to let's look at the opportunity set and, and look at the data. The opportunity set is vast. There are thousands and thousands of companies within the various public markets around the world. Within the U.S., that represents roughly 60 percent of the opportunity set. And then kind of to, to not to your direct po earlier point, but you have to then ask, well, OK, should I try and pick the winners? We've talked about that, right? Individual stock picking doesn't make any sense. Trying to identify who are going to be the winners within that vast opportunity set is, is just has been proven throughout time to be a very, very difficult proposition within the public markets. And so really at the, at the end of the day to kind of get to the, the initial answer here, it's, it's trying to participate very thoughtfully, intelligently, smartly across that entire opportunity set, the, the global market capitalization um, where, where efficient access can be had to those very various marketplaces or stock markets really at the end of the day. Yeah. And it takes something mentally. I think there's, it's worth acknowledging. It is a little bit more difficult to wrap your head around starting to invest in other places, places that aren't familiar to you. You know, we're sitting here in the US. So investing here in the US, it's been a fantastic journey over the last, you know, 100 plus years. We've talked about right. that. It's been a huge growth opportunity. But like when we talk about other investment opportunities, you, you shouldn't fall in love with one single investment category, right? You should start to look at things and compare and contrast. Sure, the U.S. fantastic. This has been a great growth story over time, but there are other places that have actually grown more phenomenally. Uh, and you've missed out on those returns if you've been allocated to the U.S. the entire time. And we're not saying that you shouldn't have a meaningful allocation. What we're saying is, you know, or the way that we approach it is that you take a look at what is the opportunity set like you you mentioned and start there. So that's how we start, right? We start with building portfolios. We look at it and we say, hey, roughly we want 60. You know, we'll, we'll add a little bit more maybe uh, because we do live here. We do spend money in the US. Uh, so maybe there'll be a little bit of what we in the industry call a home bias. But at the end of the day, you don't want much more than 60% of your assets on the, the equity side is what we're talking about. Right invested, you know, outside, you want to invest outside the U S and there's good reasons for that. We're going to unpack some of that. Uh, but you know, I think another fun thing to maybe go down is like you hit on is systematically predicting, you know, and when you start, you see all these fun charts, right? It's these periodic table charts, you know, back yeah. from, from science class and, you know, probably, I don't know, sixth, eighth grade, I probably wasn't paying attention enough, but <laughs> you know, you start to look at these things and you notice the, the colors are all jumbled, uh, and you can't really figure out what's going on. And there is a randomness to these returns, oh, yeah. right? You can't really figure out what's going on. And this is both in the U S it's also 
outside the US, whether they're developed markets, more mature economies, or if they're more of the emerging markets, right? Right, right, right. Well, and then just to put put some context to it. So it's been a phenomenal 10 years or decade, let's call it within the US markets. Prior to that, there is something called the so-called lost decade. It's very easy to forget things like that, where at the, the beginning, of, you know, let's just take the year 2000. I, I imagine very few investors were predicting that 10 years later, the U.S. would basically have a negative return. S&P 500, there were parts of the market, which we've talked about, small value that actually did quite well over that period of time. But guess what? The U.S. as a whole actually underperformed most global marketplaces, emerging markets substantially, it was over up over 400% over that time yeah. frame. And so you just go, it goes back to this idea of long, thinking long-term, being a long-term investor, understanding that predicting and trying to go in and out, it, it just really, really is, is difficult. I, that's where you were going, Brandon, with that periodic table, right? Where you see returns from various countries stacked up, up on one another, and there truly is no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, there's probably a reason to it, but knowing that ahead of time is, is all but impossible. But really, it, it, countries jump up and down and up and down and kind of getting back to, to the actual numbers, right? We think the US has, has done so well, and it has. It's been a phenomenal place to invest. But let's just go back to 2021. And guess what? US was up towards the top. But good old Austria, yeah, right there, Austria, right there, th number three one, three-time champ in the and last twenty yeah, years, three-time champ. So the, the good old, the good old Nordics, right? Uh, Finland also up there three times over the last uh, what fifteen years, uh, it looks like. So, uh, you know, we we talk about the U.S. being such a great place to invest, or a lot of people do, and it, it is. It's, it is a phenomenal place, and, and especially because we live here, it's from a market cap standpoint the largest single country around, and so the vast majority of assets should be there. But so many people say, oh, the U.S. is, is truly the best market. And, and really, quite frankly, it's not. Yeah. And that, that, that doesn't mean you should go put all your money in Austria or, or the, the fin, fin, Finnish stock market either, right? It's, it's understanding that there are pockets that will outperform. There are pockets that will underperform. Who knows what the next 10 years will, will uh, unfold, how it will unfold here in the U.S., uh, Chances are international emerging markets might might very well do better given what's happened over the last decade. And it just goes back to this idea of, of well, diversification, smart diversification, which is what we're talking about today, but also having this long term perspective. Yeah, no, I think it's great points. And I think, you know, reflecting even over that 20 year period, the U.S., they only led once. And that's a you know, we often talk about that in meetings with new prospects or clients is, you know, you want to put all your money in the U.S. Well, guess how many times they've actually led the led the charge? It was 2014. So it wasn't even 2021. And, you know, you move over to the emerging markets, for instance. So, you know, the, the growth companies, it actually becomes even more random there. I'm sure everybody, you know, last 2021, January 1st, fireworks going off. And we all thought, yeah, let's double down on the Czech Republic this year. I don't know too many people that were <laughs> making that move. Uh, but but the checks came in and they they took it away. I mean, it was a, a banner year uh, in 2021 right. for them. But, I, you know, we're kind of saying all this tongue in cheek. But the, the point is, is that you deserve to get, capture all of these returns. And if you're, you know, you've got an advisor that just is really comfortable because they can communicate to you what the S&P 500 is, et cetera. And, that's a lazy approach and yeah. you deserve better than that. You deserve a globally diversified portfolio that captures all of these returns and helps to really increase that risk adjusted return for your portfolio, for your overall financial structure. It's just something that, that, you know, you, re you really should focus on. And I want to dig a little bit deeper on why we say you deserve that. And it goes back to really this whole concept of, of protecting your priorities. And, and that's really our definition of success. Yeah. It, it, at the end of the day, success is, is a client, an investor meeting their priorities over, over whatever their time frame is. The next 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, maybe it's multi-generational in a lot of uh, the cases of our clients. Um, and, and why that ties into this conversation is by, by having broad diversification, by focusing on the data, understanding where risk and return truly come from, it gives you a, a higher level of 
confidence in in meeting your priorities. We d- we can't predict the future with 100% certainty. We can't say the US market's going to re- return x percent over the next 10 years or or Austria's going to do uh a y percent um and as I say that I realize Austria is not not in the Nordics, but uh that's neither here nor there. Anyway, uh it, it it gives us this level of confidence and, and rigor in building your portfolio and structuring it to support your priorities. Picking individual stocks starts to diminish that or, mm-hmm. or trying to time the market or time which country to be in starts to, to break down the level of confidence we have in someone's ability to meet their priorities. And that I think that's a really, really important distinction to, to make here where the common practice in the industry is buying and selling stocks, trying to time the market. And really at the end of the day, that is putting your financial structure or your financial, your priorities and meeting those priorities at risk. There is, there is a chance that one of those, those stocks or one of those countries actually does outperform, but that's generally luck. I mean, the, the research, the data shows that that's that's due to luck as opposed to to skill versus structuring a portfolio based on on the data based on our understanding of where risk and return truly come from and how you're actually compensated for taking risk and it, and it all feeds into saying okay th- this is a portfolio that is is backed by academic research the data makes sense we don't know exactly what the rates of return are going to be but there's a very high likelihood or a much higher likelihood that your your priorities will be met if the overall portfolio is structured in, in the right way absolutely i think that's a, a great point and you know we've been spending a lot of time you know so far on talking about just being diversified globally but there's also the case for diversification within those markets and i don't want to kind of close out here without at yeah. least touching that is you know i had a conversation with a client yesterday well large growth has to outperform right and and we had to unpack no actually you know there are other factors that that outperform over time small companies value companies etc and there's a randomness to all of this as well you know i i think a lot of people fall in love with an asset class um but the randomness i i thought i pulled up this example because i thought it was very illustrative and it's u.s real estate Everybody loves U.S. real estate. If you've looked around over the past few years, it seems like it's done unbelievable. But the reality is in 2019, it was actually in the middle of the pack of returns. Then 2020, last place. 2021, first place. There, there's no rhyme or reason how this actually plays out. And I think we, our brains obviously always anchor, or not obvious, but I think many times anchor to US residential real estate and the real estate market is broad and vast. Right. You wanna participate across the entire real estate market. You wanna participate across the entire US company market. You don't want just the S&P 500. To your earlier point, the S&P 500 in that lost decade lost 9% yeah, nine percent. When you when you compare and contrast that to some of the other uh, markets or the other segments of the U.S. market, it's it's absolutely staggering. If you would have just focused on large value companies during that period, you would have had a return of forty eight percent versus negative nine. Right. So you start to eliminate companies and and really just focus in and become less diversified in these markets and then you you brought it up earlier but you know you go to the emerging markets i mean they're up 400 percent, like you said so i just want to hammer home this point at the end of the day that smart diversification is a broad allocation across the globe it's a broad allocation within each of the asset classes that you're picking and you need to do that very intelligently we've talked about other factors etc but even if you just did that you're going to have a much better investment experience for sure um and so you know i definitely want to reiterate this whole thing is about focusing on the things that you can actually control you know you need to establish that that sound financial structure like you mentioned justin that's a huge huge part of having a better investment experience uh you need to have an investment strategy that you actually understand and we acknowledge it's a little bit more difficult to understand just because it's not commonly the talking heads on tv aren't selling it because it's not that exciting you know all those types of things so it takes a little bit of work but if you're listening to this you're probably at least on the path to doing that work you know you want to make sure that those investments are tax aware and low cost 
That's also going to be a yeah. key key in this. But then ultimately what we've been talking about today, you've got to practice smart diversification. So, you know, next week we're going to jump into a little bit of a shift and continue down this, this path. And it's, it's going to be about managing your emotions. Probably not a bad time to, to be talking about that. We're recording this currently. The markets are off pretty substantially for the year. Um, a lot of emotions flying around. How do we do that? We're going to get into, you know, one of the best ways to do that is with your financial structure, really understanding that, really understanding what your priorities are and building your portfolio so you can weather storms like this. And you don't have to get emotional. You don't have to be freaking out. You can have a lot of confidence in where you're sitting. So we're going to close out for the day. As you know, shoot me a text, shoot Justin a text. Uh, we both get this uh, text message. Phone number is 602-704-5574. And until next time, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. The information in this podcast is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.